Well, you just met the 12-year-old Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and the 11-year-old Mary Beard. And now in time travel, they have come to you a few years later to tell you about their lives lived. Mary Beard, was that really, it really feels like that was a little Mary Beard. I have, to, I have to say, I don't know how they found that wonderful girl, but I was the spitting image. She was the spitting image of me. It was like time travel. I was quite serious. Like, you know, she's quite, you know, she's going to go far and she's quite serious. And I was quite serious too then. And not just the spitting image, but the passion for ideas, which is what you have come to be known for, that ideas matter. Yeah, I'm looking you in the eye, you know. And Chimamanda, what, what about you? What did you think of yours? I, I was quite similar to Mary, um, annoyingly serious, a little smug. Yeah. Um, I thought I knew more than I did. I, and I think I was a lot more eloquent when I was that young. <laughs> Sadly, I no longer am. But the little Chimamanda talked about how um, girls are taught to be small and that you have to raise girls differently. That, but actually, I think when I was that age, I was observing. I don't think I had quite articulated the ideas. Um, but but I, knew, I, I knew those things, I had seen them, I, I had observed them, and, and then when I, when I was older, I started to um, make sense of them with language. You were much more observant than me. I mean, I think when I was at that age, I mean, I, I bore some similarity, that's true, but I think I'd really never noticed that women didn't quite have the same chances. I went to an all-girls school, I was an only child, um, I, by the time I was about 14 or 15, I was beginning to read things like um, Simone de Beauvoir and Germaine Greer, but I still thought it applied to somebody else. It wasn't until I got to university that I realised, you know, hey, everyone, there's a problem here. But, how, but why? why? Why was it university that made you realise that? It was the first time <laughs> that I saw, and I can remember the moment, um, somebody observing that I would not do as well because I was female. I, a friend of mine, a guy who's a still good friend, came into my room. He picked up one of my essays from the floor, which had been marked. He looked at it, and the bottom, it said, this is very good, it, it would get a first-class result. And he looked at me and said, what, you get a first? And I thought, the only way this dear boy, who I was terribly fond of, thinks that I would not get a first is because I'm female, he knows nothing else. And how old were you? Uh, but then I was about 19. Uh -huh. And it, it was the first moment it really went home in practice. I mean, you know, I, you know, I could read any bit of feminist theory you liked, yeah. but to know it mattered, mattered to me didn't happen until later. Well, let's just <laughs> stop for a moment. Mary Beard has been variously described as the UK's national treasure, indeed a, perhaps a global treasure, the, most, the best known classicist anywhere. And the book behind you, Mary Beard, Women in Power, was a best-selling book on both sides of the Atlantic and beyond. And it's about a history of silencing women's voices. And Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, We Should All Be Feminists, it all started as a talk in 2012, and then it became a book in 2014. Jimamanda, of course, is from Nigeria. She splits her time between Nigeria and the United States and is a best-selling author, and her other books include Purple Hibiscus, Half of a Yellow Sun, and America. And we're both so pleased to have both of you here today. Both of you are not just known for your work, but you're known, you have an identity. You've both been described as icons. And Mary, you've been described as someone who's, at least here in Britain, that it's okay to be smart, it's cool to be smart, and that it's good to be known by your ideas. And that has resonated, particularly with women of all generations, including this next generation, but with men as well. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the, the turning point um, was when I did one of my first television programs. And there was a very famous, extremely hostile review um, in the Sunday Times by A.A. A. Gill, which basically <laughs> said... Dearly Dear, departed. Yeah. Dearly departed, departed, actually. Um, you know, what the hell, you know, can't she do something about the way she looks? You know, if she's going to come onto our television screens, you know, she might as well, you know, she, she better primp up a bit, you know. You know, she looks 16 from behind and 97 from the front, and <laughs> why did she not get something done about her teeth? And on and on and on. And 
it, for me, I'm actually for quite a bit of... Hard for, to, for someone to... It's very cruel. It's cruel, but it's also... When you read something like that, you, you think, this isn't about me. This is not, again, this is not really about me. You know, this guy is sounding off about something he doesn't like that I represent. And I got a huge amount of support, and it was an interesting kind of turning point in, well, in women and telly in this country, actually, because um, you know, the idea that you, know, you could have middle-aged, grey-haired women as well as middle-aged, grey-haired, craggy blokes on the telly was only just starting. And the thing that resonated with women across the generations was when I kind of at one point just replied to say, I was then 55, not 63, I said, what do you think a 55-year-old woman looks like? She looks like me, right? If she doesn't look like me, she's had work done, right? <laughs> now, you know, some of us just want to look like we're 55. We don't mind looking that we're 55. And suddenly, you know, even some of the most kind of conservative readerships in this country, like the Daily Mail readers, they said, right, you know, you can. You know, you can look like us and still be in front of a camera, ladies. Great. <laughs> and Tim Amount, in your own way, I mean, it's an issue of your identity, who you are, and you, this has also resonated through your work and from what I've read of you is that your identity you feel it differently when you're in the United States and when you're in Nigeria about not just who you are but how people relate to who you are yes I, I think when I'm in the U.S. I'm one identity I took up when I moved to the I didn't quite move to the I went to the U.S. to go to college and I went to the U.S. because I didn't want to become a doctor and I was I was in medical school in Nigeria for one year and so I fled and went to the US. And the identity I took up there and that I felt was thrust on me was blackness. It was a racial identity, which I hadn't thought about in Nigeria because I didn't need to think about race in Nigeria. I was too busy thinking about so many other problems. <laughs> but really, race is not one of an, it's not an identity marker in Nigeria. Um, so in the US, I became black. I became a black woman with all of its um, attendant uh, stereotypes. And it was a learning experience for me because I'd come from a place where black achievement was not remarkable. But in the US, it seemed to be. And it's interesting because the, the story about the, the essay that uh, Mary tells, I have a similar story. But in this case, it wasn't gender, it was race. So it was a professor in my first class. In the who, United States. Yes, yes. Who said, who wrote this essay? We'd, said, we'd sent in the essays by email and I'd used my initial and my last name. And so I think my last name isn't quite, I mean, it's, I don't think it's that obviously African hmm. or black. And so when I raised my hand, he looked really surprised. Oh. And it was a very tiny moment, but it was one of those moments that was just clarifying because I thought, oh, right, that's what it means to be black in America. So how did that feel? It felt, do you know, really, I had come from Nigeria. Fortunately, I, I had um, this wonderful Nigerian arrogance. You know, in Nigeria, we have <laughs> arrogance for breakfast every morning. Um, <laughs> and so what I thought Let's was... Let's confidence. Let's be confidence. Uh, I'm actually joking, but I mean confidence. Yes, yes. I really thought he was silly. I just thought, what an idiot. Yeah. You know, he really is surprised. But, but, but again, I, it, was, I was fortu I was, it was possible for me to say that because I don't have the history of African Americans, you know, that, that it would have been a very different experience for me if I had that. Back in Nigeria, I do not think about race. When I get off the plane in Lagos, I don't think about race. But then I'm so much more aware of gender. And in Nigeria, gender is very much in your face, which in some ways can be refreshing. People will say to you, for example, oh, a woman cannot be president of this country, right? In Nigeria, or? Yes, they'll tell you. In and in the U.S. too. <laughs> in the U.S., they are thinking it. They're not saying it as often. Hmm. I think it's really interesting what you say about thinking it, thinking that somebody's remarks like that or surprise is silly, because I think that um, quite a lot of modern feminism has traded on outrage. And I felt... You know, I think outrage is good in its place. I think, you know, outrage gets things done. But I think that somehow an awful lot of the stuff that we face is laughable. You know, and sometimes but, you yeah. just... But it's very, very hurtful it. too. And yeah. some women can't laugh. But and yes, men for that I matter too. That is true. Yeah. yeah. But somehow if we allowed laughter as one possible response mm. to some of this, 
Mm. You know, mm. some of this shit is just silly. Mm. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I kind of, I, I do think, though, that um, Mary clearly has, I, I think if you look back at Mary's um, ancestry, she must be Nigerian because she <laughs> has that confidence. I, I think that there's some people who can't afford to laugh. Yes. And I've come to understand that because I, too, think that laughter is an appropriate response to some things. For me, yeah. it's laughter and rage. That's so I, I go mm. <laughs> combo. Yeah. Yeah. combo. I go from laughing yeah. to just being yeah. enraged. Yeah. And also sometimes being puzzled. Seriously. I mean, I just feel like, you know, stories that have come out recently about you sort of walk into a man's office and he sort of then proceeds to unearth his organ. And I just think well, it doesn't even make sense. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed well, to bow would, down? Yes, you know? I mean, yes. seriously. The, yes. the good thing about laughter is it's always, 99% of the time, it's a, an assertion of power. Mm -hmm. So to laugh at them not only deems that behaviour as laughable, it also puts you on top. Now, both of you are very interesting, because if I can say as a BBC correspondent, so sort of a factual statement, both of you are much loved and appreciated for your writing and what you do, what you're good at. But you both, and as we've been hearing, have had to deal with years of your critics. And yet both of you have, I think, decided is on the balance between engage or ignore, you have a different response. Chimamanda, you're, you're nodding. How do you deal with that? Because everyone here, I'm sure in their own life, has to deal with a certain measure of what we're talking about. I, I think I mostly ignore. I, I try to be very careful what I let in. And so I'm not on social media. At all? You don't do anything? Instagram, nope. Twitter, nope. Facebook? Nope. I have an Instagram thing, but that's just for my fashion. And it's, okay. it's, oh, it's handled by my nieces. I don't even have the app. I don't know how it works. So I just take pictures and send them to my nieces and they, and and they do it. And you never ask what's on it? Nobody says, oh my God, you should see what's what they're saying on Twitter or never, you just... I, no, when, when, when there's noise about something I've said, I invariably I hear about it, mm. right? Um, but I don't go looking and I don't go reading them. And it's not for any high-handed reason. It's really because I know that if I did, and being a slightly obsessive person, that I might then want to go find all those people and go to their houses and tell them off. So, yeah. so because of that, I just don't want, I just think that it's, I don't have the emotional space for that. I want to read poetry and write fiction and think about things. I just feel like I, I don't know how to handle, I would spend all my time. Mm. I mean, my publicist said to me, it's such a good thing you're not on Twitter because <laughs> I would spend all my time extracting you from fights. Uh, so Mary now goes to their house and invites them to lunch, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but my, hus you... my husband says that to me. He says, put that Twitter away. He says, just put it away. So tell us about your well, philosophy. I mean, Mary, I mean, I'm, because I, I follow Mary and, and, and admire her and I read her and I'm just puzzled, both puzzled and admiring of her approach to it and, and, and her willingness to engage because I see some value to but it. But there must be success in it, Mary. Yeah, there's, there's this is why I mean, I, I, I've had, as I think most women who put, ever put their head above the parapet have had, you know, I've had threats of rape, of dismemberment, of murder, you know, the full gamut. And that, that sounds rather kind of nice compared to what they, how they actually put it, you know? And I, from the very beginning, I found myself thinking, after, after a little while, when people said to me, oh, just block them and don't, don't respond. I, I did that for a bit and I felt, I felt quite uncomfortable because I thought, look, I'm interested in women speaking out and what you're telling me to do when someone does, threatens me in some, some unpleasant way is to shut up. Well, women have been told to shut up for the last two and a half thousand years. <laughs> and, you know, I've had enough of this. So I kind of then just broke through that and I thought, right, I'm going to reply. Um, and I'm going to reply politely and I think 99.9% .9 of the time I managed that. Um, mostly if you say, look, I'm sorry, I didn't actually say that. If you go and read it again, I think you'll find I was making a different point. Now, if you say that, 50% of the people that you're replying to will say, gosh, you're right, I'm terribly sorry, I was feeling angry. You know? And you come to see that most of these, and they're mostly guys, but not all, I think, most of these people who really attack you on Twitter are um, sad, not bad, 
or they're drunk, or they're disinhibited, or it's late at night, or they've had a row with their best mate, and they're taking it out on the anonymity of the Twitter sphere. And you, you just happen to get in the way. And if you kind of say, excuse me, guys, person here, mm. and I didn't say it, the majority, not all of them, will um, sometimes become your become your friends. I did it to one guy, as mm. Lisa's referring to, who was clearly on holiday, university student, absolutely plastered, and he said some <laughs> extremely nasty things about my private parts and how they might smell. And I wrote, I said, I think it might be an idea if you just took it down. I uh, meant the tweet, nothing, not anything else. Uh, <laughs> and he didn't. Then somebody said, it, it's got to be a conversation. And somebody said, look, I know his mum. Ah. I think she'll get him to take it down. <laughs> and indeed, the tweet soon disappeared. Looked like happy ending. Until um, he, well, he then decided it got, got into the newspapers. He came to Cambridge. He took me out to lunch. He apologised face to face. Aww. Which was, Did his know, mother tell him to do that? I, I don't care who told her to do it. I think it's pretty brave, you know? And he came, and everything looked super until he tried to get a job. When, when he tried to get a job, these tweets and the story oh. of these tweets were still um, in what you Googled. They were the newspaper reports. So in the Ooh. end, I had, to, I had to end up... And I did quite happily, writing him a reference, writing him a letter of recommendation. Because the only person who could say, authoritatively, that he had apologised, that it was a very stupid thing to do, that my students do just as stupid things too, and we forgive them because they're young, the only person who could say that was me. And eventually got a job, mm. and he's now long. Okay. Well, I'm sure but, we can find someone from Google here who might be able to remove all that terrible content <laughs> from the... But I, I do yeah. want to... I mean, I, so in responding, I'm struck by your being polite 99% of the time. And, and I... Why? Why, why are they deserving of politeness? <laughs> and also, I think that it, there's something about that that is also gendered, that idea that a woman... So we're, we're, while we push back against the idea of a woman being silent, we're, in some ways, it seems to me that we are... Um, the stereotype of the woman having to be nice, having to, you know, behave, be polite, don't be angry. If you're angry, sort of make sure your anger is dressed up nicely, that sort of thing. I, Why not just say uh, F you to them? I right? see that. Uh, and uh, there is quite often a temptation to say even worse than that. <laughs> uh, but I think for me, it's a bit like what you're saying about laughter. You know, it's politeness as a mechanism of control. I am not going to show that you've really got me cross. I'm just going to say, I'm terribly sorry. I don't think you have read what I wrote correctly. And it... I have to say, I think, in some ways, it's the most patronising and um, aggressive thing. You know, politeness can be extremely aggressive. You know, they expect you to say, oh, F off, you nasty little, you know, whatever. And instead you say, look, I'm terribly sorry, um, but I think you're wrong. And okay, it, well, it's very unsettling. Mm, so I think it's... I, I see your point. But we have two. Here we have two, two, two of the finest minds around disagreeing on this. How many of you are on the FU camp <laughs> that believes that let's respond to it with, with, uh, with, some, with a confident, angry rebuttal? How many of you take that approach? How many of you, oh, just, okay. And how many of you like to be nice? And how many of you just ignore it? <laughs> Maybe that's See, Google said. I, I think the key here is to say there isn't a right answer. There isn't a right, every, there is everyone no says right there is no right answer. right answer. But let me, I just want to, we have about five minutes left. I want to, I hope that I'm not going to ask for, of course, if you want to criticize, you now know how they're going to respond. So maybe say something nice instead. <laughs> um, any questions from the audience? Everyone's terrified now. They don't want to this in the back. Yes, the woman in the back. Yes. Hello. Um, that was brilliant. I'm, I'd love to hear your advice. There's lots of, um, I'm a mum to boy-girl twins. And uh, there's lots of support and advice about how to support my daughter and uh, lots of very strong voices, but actually, of late, there's a concern around what are we doing to responsibly bring up our sons as well. Is what would you say to to parents out here who've got sons? How do they tackle everyday yes. friends? Well, I mean, what, what I would I really think that we need to allow boys to be vulnerable 
to teach boys to be vulnerable, to give them the language of emotion. And I find that in reading about different cultures, it cuts across everywhere this kind of masculinity that we have constructed. And I think it's just terrible for boys that, that when a little boy falls down still, very often, you know, he's not expected to cry. Yes. That little girls get more sort of love and hugs. And I think boys need to get as much hugs and, and that we should expect vulnerability from them, teach them vulnerability. And I think the idea of um, sort of that, that strength is overrated, you know? <laughs> um, because I think it just makes people perform and pretend. Um, I think masculinity is a terrible cage. I, I do think that many men feel trapped in it and and the way to undo it, sometimes I think it's too late for men who are adults, sadly. But the way to undo it is to start very early to, to not create that cage, to not expect the boy to be um, strong and to be the provider. Actually, to shame him when he doesn't cry. Because I think shame is actually quite a potent um, force. So expect him to cry. And, <laughs> Mary, you got and I think yeah. also we need to tell girls that it's okay for boys to cry. Because that's something else that um, the expectations of women, I think, sometimes yeah. hold back the behaviour of men. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that I, I've got a boy and a girl. And, um, well, they're now over 30. But um, I, I think when, I, when they were young, I was much too hung up on the kind of practicalities of it. I was much too hung up in kind of pressing Barbie dolls to my son and making my daughter play with trains. When actually, that's just an epiphenomenon. You know, really what was at stake. And what I think I didn't see then was precisely what Chimamanda's talked about. You know, I don't, you know in the end, it doesn't matter who wears pink. Yeah. You know, mm. it matters who's allowed to cry. Yeah. Mm. Okay, Rose, just right here. Thank you. Chimanda, I was very struck by something you said. You said... I'm Please very, introduce yourself, Rose. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. I'm uh, Rose Gottemuller. I'm the Deputy Secretary General at NATO. So very interested in your comment uh, that I'm very careful about what I let in. And I'm very mindful that Malala Yousaf made a similar comment, very similar comment, when mm. Lise interviewed her this morning. And what is common, I think, in both your cases is that you keep your eye on the prize. You've both got goals. You've both got things you want to accomplish. And don't you think in the end of the day that's the best advice, to keep mm. your eye on the prize and let all that other stuff go by the wayside? I'd be interested in what Mary thinks, too. I, that's very good advice from NATO, I think, if you're high <laughs> Well said. Yeah. I, I think Mar what Mary said about not, not that there isn't a right way, I think in the end it's about doing what feels comfortable. I wouldn't feel comfortable engaging. I don't think, I just, I don't know how to do that in a way that's useful. And, and I'm also, I just, there's so much I want to do. There's so many books I haven't read. I have a huge pile and, and I want to get through them. But also, I just wanted to say, most of Mary's critics, she said, are mostly men. Mine are not just men, they're men and women. And, and I, I mean, on the subject of gender and, and all of that. And um, so, you know, the 50% the who, are, who are nice when you engage, I don't know what 50% of women would do because Having observed people in all girls' schools, you just never know what you're going to get. And it, it is hard to know what gender they are on, uh, you know, yeah. on, on Twitter. Yeah. And I, um, I've, I've concluded that the, that the very nasty ones mm. are male, but maybe that's my rationalisation. Yeah, I think it you just might. It may be. Yeah. It may be. But I, I, I think that, for me, the engagement is part of what I do. And I, I'm, I suppose I come back down to the idea of, you know, my day job is as a university teacher and I argue with people and I'm paid to argue with people and I argue with my students and when they don't get it quotes right, uh, I, I, I engage yes. and I don't really see, I, mean, I, I know all the reasons why Twitter's different, but actually when somebody says something to me that I don't agree with, I answer back and I find it's quite hard to stop myself and I think that's my job in a way. Yeah. Mm. I, I quite like a good argument, but I like to have an arg <laughs> I, I like to have arguments with, with actual people, not ghosts. Mm, yes, I just we have we have less than a minute left. And I just want to just bring the thread of our conversation back to where this conversation started today at Google when Matt Fry talked about this moment in history, and one of the historic moments now is 100 years since at least some British women got the right to vote, and I know. Um, and this is not to exclude the men, but there's a sense among some women that inspired by this century of struggle, that this is the year of women. 
and the sense of that more is possible. We see the hashtag Me Too movement, but yet in some ways women are, as we've been hearing, women are fighting the old battles about what you wear, about harassment, etc. How do you situate, since both of you had an acute sense of history, how do you situate the moment we are in now? Mary first. Um, I think it's um, both, I mean, there's a sense of both huge success and failure. You know, I've lived through a revolution. My mother was born before women had the vote. Um, I have seen dramatic changes. But the failure, or the next, <laughs> let's put it in you know, new speak, the next challenge is, I think, what both Chimamanda and I talk about in our books, is what goes on in people's heads. It's the language we use. And I used to think that workplace nurseries and maternity leave and equal pay, God help us, would get us there. And actually, it's what's inside. And we haven't got there yet. We haven't. I mean, I think changing cultural mindsets, that's so stubborn and so persistent. That's what actually interests me. Changing language. I mean, what Me Too has shown me is that we need to do something about the language that women are allowed to use to talk about sexuality and talk about their bodies. What Me Too shows me is that, I mean, there's a problem of male harassment, blah, 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 but also about just women feeling entitled to be sexual beings. We're still not there yet. And so I think I, I feel cautiously optimistic about Me Too, but I, I kind of feel that there's a lot of work to be done and that it has to be done by women and men. Yeah. It has to be, men have to be part of it. We agree. Men and women <laughs> of this Google zeitgeist, I think that's a very good way for us to end. It's up to all of us. Please join me in thanking our brilliant guests. Thank you.